Welcome to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life. My name is Tracy Crow. I'm an author, writing coach, and Marine Corps veteran. I'm looking forward to co-creating today's show with you. So if you're ready, are you ready? I'm ready. So if you're ready to live a more creative, more magical life, let's get started. Before we get started today, I want to share two pieces of news. First, thanks to grant funding from San Antonio College, I'll be leading a free day-long writing workshop that even includes lunch on June 10th for women military veterans. The workshop will be held in the college's Victory Center. So if you're in San Antonio on June 10th and you're a woman veteran, I hope you'll join us. You'll find the Eventbrite link for registration in the description of today's podcast. And my second piece of news, thanks to a lot of nudging, prodding from a lot of developmental editing clients, I recently decided to form Tracy Crow Literary Agency, LLC. That's right. It's the only aspect of this business I haven't done yet, so although I have been doing it behind the scenes, placing writers in their manuscripts after the editing process with just the right publishers for their work, and so I've decided to do it officially. Now, this doesn't mean that I'm no longer available as a writing coach, so if you visit our Podbean website here, you'll still find the coaching scheduler, and you can schedule a one-on-one consult with me if you like, or you can even set up a writing workshop for you and your friends. So you can still do that by, by clicking on the coaching scheduler on this Podbean website. This means, as usual, I'm wearing a lot of hats. And you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. As my astrologer guru friend Deborah Silverman would say, your five planets in Capricorn sure are showing. (laughs) Yes, it's all about being busy and productive for us Capricorns, isn't it? Okay, which is the perfect segue, I think, for today's episode. If you remember in episode 29, I shared that May is my favorite month. And I said I might even get around to sharing why in an upcoming episode. Well, today is that episode. You see, every May for at least a decade, I've had this fantasy to become a gardener, the type of gardener who raises her own vegetables, but more specifically, a gardener who can raise the type of flavorful German Johnson tomatoes I remember from childhood, my grandmother peeling and slicing ripe tomatoes picked from her backyard vines for the sandwiches we would have at dinner slathered with Duke's mayonnaise. But you see, I can't even keep a house plant alive. I can barely remember to water the potted ferns on my front and back porches. But every winter for years, I've scoured through gardening magazines and plotted how to raise a vegetable garden and the perfect tomato. When a friend a few years ago suggested the book, The Market Gardener, about sustainable gardening and how to turn an acre of land into an annual income of $100,000, I was really hooked. I surveyed our front pasture and the one in the back. I talked over the idea with friends who had put in a garden every year. I talked it over with my husband, who quickly nixed the whole idea using this Achilles heel as a weapon. But when would you have time to write? Ah, true. Because you see, time to a writer is always the most precious, most revered commodity. Whatever a writer is doing instead of writing is the very thing keeping that writer from her writing. I don't recall who said it, but it went something like, If you want to be a serious writer, don't get a dog or a houseplant because you'll end up killing both of them. (laughs) Fortunately, our three dogs are surviving just fine, but the potted ferns do have to be replaced about midway through summer. Nevertheless, I scour through gardening magazines every winter, plotting and planning and hoping this will be the May when I'll just do it. 
five years ago when I couldn't sell my husband on that idea of converting an acre into a profitable, sustainable garden, I bought a raised cedar bed from one of those online gardening supply companies. And I bought the largest one too, their two by eight version. I bought their red tomato cages. I bought gardening gloves. I bought the cute little stakes with reusable signs as identifying markers, basil, chives, butter lettuce, radishes, etc. When the raised cedar bed arrived that spring, I was in the throes of another book and didn't even remember I'd ordered the raised cedar bed until late August when I finished the first draft of that book. The next May came and went and I was involved in another book project. The following May came and I had just taken over the leadership of my nonprofit Millspeak Foundation and I was busy writing grants and developing writing workshops for military veterans and their families and so on and so on. Five years, five Mays and the raised cedar bed still in its original container in our garage until this May. That's right. The raised cedar bed has now been constructed. The seeds and tomato seedlings have arrived and I feel stuck. I think every morning, what are you waiting for? This is the May you've been anticipating for more than a decade. And then it strikes me, fear. I am facing the same type of fear about this new creative undertaking that I often feel just before the deep dive into the unknown with a new book that I feel called to write. Writing a book, creating anything, frankly, requires that deep dive into the unknown. But this is just a vegetable garden, I tell myself. Good grief, who even cares whether you can grow a radish or a tomato? Just do it. (laughs) And then, and then I remembered a scene I'd written a few years ago for my novella, Cooper's Hawk, The Remembering. In this particular scene, a main character, Phoebe Kennedy, who's a former combat nurse during Vietnam, has experienced the mental breakdown she's put on hold for decades. And so, for the first time ever, I'll publicly read that excerpt now, which reveals through Phoebe's sudden epiphany what I'm most fearful about when it comes to planting a garden. locked up as a POW in the Cooper VA psych ward for someone like Phoebe who survived 313 days as a POW in Vietnam. The list of indignities is too great to mention here. Whatever you can imagine is probably not harsh enough to make that list. After she went missing for six months, her family gave up and held a memorial service so that when she was finally rescued and returned home, she had a pile of bureaucracy to battle through just to reclaim her identity. After all, she'd been through this bureaucratic nightmare felt ever more injurious. A name change would have been far easier. A fresh start seemed more appropriate given the media attention that elicited inappropriate public discussions about why women had no business anywhere close to the front line of combat. See, they would say, this is what happens when you send a woman to war. Or, remember Phoebe Kennedy, nobody wants to become another Phoebe Kennedy. And, the U.S. can never allow another Phoebe Kennedy. Her own family had tiptoed around her. Nobody asked how she was feeling or whether she wanted to talk about anything. Her father, the World War II veteran of the family, was no more help than her mother. During his first week in Europe, he had accidentally been shot in the toe by a fellow soldier who had fallen asleep on post and discharged the weapon. So her father was soon home again with one less toe, a purple heart, and a medical discharge. 
After Phoebe managed to rescind the death certificate and renew her life, she left her parents' home in Pennsylvania for that job at the Cooper VA. One of the doctors recognized her from their time in Ply Coo. They'd liked each other even then, an instant chemistry typical between nurses and doctors, even the married ones, who found it easy to justify any sort of behavior when you never knew when or where the next incoming mortar might land. But while Phoebe was just beginning her year of service in country, her doctor friend was nearing the end of his, so they had made the best of the month they had together, and then he was gone. She received one letter from him to say he'd taken a job with the VA, but didn't reveal which VA, and this was revelation enough that he wasn't considering her in his future plans. So she forgot him and moved on to another and another and another, a string of doctors who came and went, some left for other field evacs with emergency needs, some left in body bags. You kept your sanity best you could while knee-deep in blood, guts, and the discarded limbs of young soldiers and Marines. So imagine Phoebe's surprise when she rediscovered her first ply coup doctor at the Cooper VA. He appeared equally surprised and more than interested, not to mention long ago divorced, so they rekindled what they thought they'd sparked in Ply Coup. All the drinking helped, of course, and soon Phoebe was pregnant. This wasn't her first pregnancy. You can't suffer what Phoebe suffered for 313 days and escape pregnancy. But internment's lack of nutrition, coupled with physical beatings and other physical and emotional stresses, caused her body, or her mind, to reject what it couldn't have sustained in such an environment. But this pregnancy in Cooper, she thought, will be sustainable. She'd put the weight back on and been treated with so many rounds of antibiotics since her return to the States, she'd avoided every influenza outbreak and bug for two years. Here in the sleepy, peaceful valley of Cooper, ringed by the majesty of blue, purplish mountains, this was a world in which to bring a child. So she married the doctor, and they bought a bungalow on the side of a steep hill that overlooked the valley. But during the fourth month, her body objected and rejected this pregnancy, too. And four months later, Phoebe rejected her doctor husband, who sold the bungalow below market for a quick relocation to another VA across country and didn't tell Phoebe which VA. She could have found out had she really wanted to know, but she didn't. Life, hers anyway, resembled a repeating pattern of disillusionment and she assumed this meant she was here to conquer disappointment in all of its many forms rather than seek any sort of self-fulfillment. Vowing to avoid as many repeating patterns as possible, Phoebe chose to remain single despite a number of proposals over the next several decades. She found all the companionship she could handle within the veteran community of the Cooper VA in her caring of Vietnam veterans especially, and during meaningful conversations with Dove Jennings and Harold Jay, who would often encourage her to take an art class or a writing workshop. One day, she'd say, never intending to attend. Phoebe had resisted therapy for decades until the day she found herself sitting in Dr. Wren's office because of the sudden return of nightmares, one in particular involving an army sniper. Only Phoebe never got around to discussing the nightmares or the sniper that day. She talked instead about gardening, saying, Someday I want to create a garden full of flowers, something teeming with life. Well, What's stopping you, Dr. Wren said. Why not garden? Or how about painting flowers? Why not take one of our art classes? Oh, that's fine for others to be stimulated by creativity, Phoebe said. But after a day of caring for vets and hospice care, the last thing I want is to be stimulated by anything or anyone for that matter. But Dr. Wren pressed her. But isn't gardening just another form of creativity? Phoebe shook her head, explaining that 
digging up warm soil, discovering the magic of earthworms, and planting seeds sounded as relaxing to her as the idea of a warm bubble bath might sound to others. But Phoebe never got around to planting that garden. She had drawers filled with magazine tear sheets of gardening ideas. The next time, the last time before Phoebe's crack, when Dr. Wren pressed her again about planting a garden, Phoebe finally admitted, I just can't decide what to plant. Too many choices, too many decisions. What are you afraid of? Ah, oh, she sighed. Wasting time, I suppose. A second later, her eyes widened. No, that's not it. I'm afraid of wasting the potential life within each seed. What if I can't cultivate that potential? The responsibility is too great. I'm not ready. Never mind the scores of near dead souls. Phoebe Kennedy, favorite nurse at the Cooper VA, had coaxed back to life. She couldn't or wouldn't make the connection. So look, Despite my own personal fears of wasting time or more importantly, wasting the potential within each seed, I've just decided to make the deep dive. I've filled the two by eight raised cedar bed with potting mix. Nearby, I have lined up the packages of organic seeds and the precious, almost quivering tomato seedlings in the order they're to be planted. The cute little garden stakes with their written messages of basil, chives, radishes, butter, lettuce, tomatoes, and so on, stand by for duty. And despite the hesitation, I still feel surfacing from time to time. I think I'm ready to do this. I think I'm ready to face this gardening metaphor of fear as it relates to time and potential. I think I'm ready, finally, to create my own garden, teeming with life. And so I ask you this, is there something you've been wanting to create for a while, but have been holding yourself back? If so, are you ready to ask why? It's May. Are you ready? I hope you enjoyed today's co-creative listening experience. Please remember to leave a comment about the single greatest takeaway for you today. You know, that one thing you will remember from this day forward. Was it something funny or provocative? Was it just what you needed to hear? Please share so we can all benefit. And remember to return Tuesdays and Thursdays to accept your gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life.